thank you so much. Um, really excited to talk to you all today um, about patient priorities care, which is really just a fancy way of saying how to think about what matters most to your patients and actually do things on behalf of what matters in their lived life rather than um, what we think in our minds is important to them and what information you're going to need to know in order to start to make patient-centered decisions in your own practice yes um, at any stage of the game uh, you can start advocating for what matters to your patients uh, you just heard dr leipzig talk a bit about what matters most to patients uh, when it comes to the m's um, it, of geriatric medicine and this is one way of getting at what matters most. So I hope that you enjoy hearing a bit more about it. Um, this project has been funded by a lot of great foundations um, and its origination is with uh, Dr. Mary Tonetti, Chief of Geriatrics, former chief over at Yale. Um, now she's just given all of her time and energy to really um, disrupting disease-based care and trying to help this tide, this tide change, especially for older adults with multiple chronic illness, um, with a lot of uncertainty about what would most benefit them to start to move us away from just looking at them as a list of diseases and start to look at them in a, in a new and, and complete, more complete way. And so I have an action item that you guys might want to do if you get hooked on this like I did. <laughs> Um, myhealthpriorities.org is a site that you can use as a doctor or you can have your um, anybody aging in your life that you love. Uh, you can go through it with them and you can find out what matters most to them. And at the end of it, you can actually print something out to bring to a doctor's office or a doctor's visit. Or you as a physician can run through this website with your patient and find out what they're willing and able to do to achieve the goals that they define. And it's pretty eye-opening you might realize why you might have been spinning your wheels a bit on their blood pressure meds. Um, and then you might try after that to think about how you could anchor on those goals when you're communicating instead of anchoring on a number or a lab. And then you can think about what, what, how would I document this awesome discussion and, and what we just came up with together and rely on those preferences when you're talking about what we might try next. There's a lot of things we could do to, to work on that fatigue. So here's maybe where we could start. And then in subsequent appointments, imagine saying, you know, well, were you able to, to hang out with your grandchild on the weekend or is fatigue still getting in the way or is it something new? So it's a whole different conversation you're having with the people you treat um, rather than just seeing them as a patient with a list of diseases. Anybody know who she is? I love to read. She's an author. Her name is Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's a Potawam, um, she's a Potawatomi woman, indigenous poet and botanist educator. And um, why I put her picture here is because she changed the way I think. Um, and a lot of what I'm asking you to do is to suspend what you know, which is beautiful and amazing and really important. Um, but maybe there's a different way of looking at things and applying that knowledge that you have. And one of the things she teaches about is ecology. And uh, many people in, our, in the culture that we are, many have been raised in, in the United States, um, depending on your background. Um, but I think sort of what our economy is built on is a property economy. And that's where um, people own the things that they, that they look around at, that they try to gather things to themselves and they own them. And in that case, um, that's one way of looking at the world, but what she would teach is that there's another way that you could look at as everything as a gift in your life, um, the food you have, the shelter over your head. And this is a gift economy. So you, you could have a property economy or a gift economy. And in, a property economy, it comes with a list of rights that we have about our property. Whereas in a gift economy, there's a list of responsibilities that we have for the things that are in our possession, so to speak, that come to us as gifts. 
So when you think about looking at things from a different lens, it doesn't mean you let go of what you knew before. It just allows you a frame shift. So we're gonna go on a journey together. And why are we gonna undertake this journey? Where there's multiple chronic illnesses, there's uncertainty. You never know how a medication for one disease is gonna interact with another or disease disease. All these trade-offs that you're contending with and you have a lot of different perspectives. So um, the perspective of the patient, the perspective of the cardiologist, the percep perception of the internist, the social worker, you have a lot of different pieces of information coming in and healthcare can start to get really burdensome. So if you start to treat all 20 of the diseases with all of the, you know, each of the articles that taught you how to treat each of those diseases, you're talking about a lot of tests, a lot of interventions, a lot of medications, and they don't all work together. Sometimes they work against each other. And then you're talking about chronicity. These are oftentimes chronic. The whole concept of chronic disease means things don't go away. It means they stay on your list. They stay with you forever. And trying to work in a, in a system where we talked about cure, uh, when, where we thought maybe we would completely uh, disrupt disease and we're not able to, you know, where do we get the language to work with that? So what I'm, what we're proposing uh, is that you move away from you need this treatment for this disease and then kind of shifting that whole conversation to knowing your health conditions and what matters most to you, I suggest we try and you fill in that care option. I see. Uh, chat yes thank you for putting up the resource sorry i'm a little far behind on the chats so this is the part where it gets interactive <laughs> it will be a total bust if it's not um we're gonna go through that website that's in your chat box right now and um we're gonna do it together so you guys are gonna be the patient i'm gonna ask you questions and you can call out really ridiculous answers but at the end of the day you're going to be an older patient with multiple chronic illnesses and you can be as silly as you want. I don't mind. Um, just so long as people are saying things, otherwise this will be really awkward. I'll just be standing here. Um, so we're proceeding as a guest. We're in our this website that I was talking about that, I, um, that I've been using with my patients um, to, to identify what matters to them. And I take the time for my initial patients um, to go through this website, I cede the time to them so that I can know them before I start throwing ideas at them about what I think is the best next move um, in terms of their care. So we'll do that today and there's about five steps. First, I'm gonna ask you what matters most to you and you're gonna suspend who you are and become this older adult, will glom all these concepts together that you all shout out with each question and answer. And we'll set a health goal. We'll review your health symptoms and problems. They can be as vague as you want. Make them tough, that's fine. And then we'll talk about the current healthcare tasks and medications that you're using. And then we'll choose the one thing to focus on. Now we're about to publish in JAMA and they made us change that language from the one thing to the top priority. And we all had different opinions as to why they changed our language, but I still stand by the one thing, because I think that for a person who's coming to you in the office, if they can say the one thing that's bothering me the most and keeping me from what matters in my life is fatigue or some symptom um, or something that's burdensome to them, I think that that makes a lot of sense to me as opposed to the top priority. So, um, we use an example, Dave, a 74-year-old guy with a uh, gentleman with diabetes and heart disease and arthritis, and we use him as an example, but because we don't have a ton of time, I'm going to do this the short way. So you guys are going to ask, I'm going to ask you questions and you'll be the patient. So welcome to my office. Um, what is your name? So I have a name. Anybody? Hi. Hi. Say it one more time. Miles. Miles. Oh, Mr. Miles. Um, Mr. Miles, so good to meet you. And uh, who is this with you in the office? Did you bring a, somebody with you? 
Emily, who's, who's with Miles in the office? Uh, his grandchild. His grandchild, lovely. Oh, I'm so glad you're both here today. Um, before we get started talking about your medical conditions, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about you, if I might. Um, and when I typically ask people, you know, what matters the most in your life? What really makes you feel like you're living your best life? Usually they'll come up with a few different answers and they'll fall into about four different categories, connecting with family and friends or spirituality, enjoying their life like productivity, recreation, maybe a hobby, functioning. And for some people, that's a sense of dignity um, or independence, managing your own life and function. And then sometimes it's even managing health symptoms because you've been living with them for a long time and it's, it's become something really important to you. As I'm asking these questions, what comes to mind for you? Bruno. Enjoying life. Enjoying life. And what does that look like for you? What does enjoying life, what are you doing when you're enjoying life? I'm making the most of my time, uh, doing the, the things I love, enjoying family, enjoying my friends, meeting new people, uh, walking around, meeting new places, uh, listening to the music that I like, seeing the movies I love. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So um, as we're moving through, I want to start to talk even more specifically on things to focus on for right now. So if you were to say something that is really important, if you weren't doing it, you would feel like you weren't living your best life. Would it be more around spending that time with your family and friends? Or would it be more around like the function being outside of your home or even going to movies? What what one of those really stands out for you as what's most important right now? Family and friends. Yeah, connecting, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. You have this wonderful granddaughter here with you. So as we're starting to think through this, I wanna get even more specific. So when you're spending time with your family and your friends, there may be some specific things you're doing each and every day or each week that could be a specific goal, that I'll know that everything I'm doing is actually working within your life to have you live your best life. So a specific activity would be um, something that you know you can do right now um, that really is meaningful to you and helps you to connect with your, fam your family and friends. So as I'm saying this, what are some of those activities that you're doing on a regular basis or would like to get back to doing that seem realistic um, that come to mind? Well, Adayo, what do you think? What would those activities be? Being able to go with my friends on walks to the park and such. Do you have a specific friend that you typically go with? My friend Carter. Okay. Um, and are you doing this for how long or how many days of the week are you doing this? We do it every day around 2 p.m. For about how long are you doing your walks? Or are you right. like- 30 minutes to the park, stay at the park and 30 minutes back home. For about 30 minutes. Thank you. Well, you're the easiest patient I've ever had. <laughs> so are we there? Are we there, Mr. Miles? Um, and maybe I'm looking out of the corner of my eye at your granddaughter. Are you walking every day at 2 p.m. for half an hour? Is this something that you're almost at or you're doing or is realistic? It's realistic. All right. So I'm gonna sort of move into symptoms you might be having. And of course, I'm not showing you the screen. Um, it's just, I'm gonna be listening to what you say and oftentimes what you guys see on the screen or what, what comes up. But is there anything that's bothersome right now that's getting in the way of your walks with your friend, Carter? Jonas, mind sharing what your symptoms are? Yes, so um, my hearing has been pretty poor um, recently and I've sometimes, feel weak in my body, uh, in my legs specifically. 
and occasionally I also get dizzy after walking for about 20 minutes. Um, not sure what that is. And it always cuts me off. So, so the dizziness bothers me most. I it does. Okay. So that's what, that's what I have to definitely get. Probably it sounds like you brought up the breathing first and the dizziness and maybe the muscle weakness is connected to those other primary symptoms. Or is the muscle weakness? Yes. Happen? No. Okay. So they happen and they happen together. Yeah, most of the time. Okay. All right. So we'll go with that for now. We can clarify more later. And then I just want to start before we we talk about what that could all be about. And I'm going to take that very seriously. I just want to first review what you're doing already in terms of your your healthcare tasks and the medications you're taking. Um, so are there any things that you're doing already to take care of your health at home? Maybe you're using a walker, oxygen. Venus, what are you doing currently at home? Yeah, so I check my glucose levels every day and I take my pressures very, very seriously. And I'm right now on a keto diet as well, so. Great. That's really helpful to know. That's a lot. You're a very motivated person. Are you, are you doing any special treatments or procedures? Um, some people will say, I will never have a surgery for the rest of my life. Um, oh, and some people are like, whatever needs to get done, get done. It, where do you sort of fall in terms of your test treatments and procedures? I know I've been told that I have to go colonoscopy several times, but I would really never do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But for now, maybe blood tests, diagnostic tests are okay, but having an yes. invasive test is less. Okay. Mm, yeah. That seems very reasonable. All right. Are you seeing any um, buddy besides me, your primary care doctor? Are you seeing specialists like a pulmonologist for your breathing or doing rehab? Elliot, which other doctors are you seeing? Um, I go to my primary care only. Okay. And are you willing to consider seeing a specialist if you needed to? Or are you really just looking for um, cutting back on the number of appointments that you're dealing with? If you think it's totally necessary, I will do it, but I prefer not to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you willing to do something like physical therapy if you needed to, if it was given at home or in the community? Joel, would you like to do physical therapy if it's needed at home or in the community? Yes, I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. That sounds like something I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. Good to know. All right, so in terms of community programs, are you having meal delivery or any in-home health? Do you help? Do you have an aid or does um, your granddaughter come check on you and help you out at home? Transportation, what sort of community programs are helping you right now? Victoria, do you mind sharing with us? Uh, yeah, I get some meal delivery and my granddaughter is an amazing cook, so she'll bring me food. All right. Does she help with anything else or anybody else help around the house? Uh, yeah, she'll drive me around and take me grocery shopping. She's just the best. She is, I agree. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about your medications and your healthcare tasks and sorting out sort of what you find helpful and what you might find burdensome. Um, we know that it, as we get older, things can get complicated and there can be a lot of things going on in terms of healthcare. Um, what right now stands out for you as being really helpful in your care? Maybe your granddaughter helping out, seeing your primary care doctor or your special keto diet. Is there anything that you know is really helping you right now? For you? I think you're muted. I know you're sharing, but I think you're muted. For me, the meal delivery is really, really helpful because I don't have uh, time to cook. And also my granddaughter drives and cooks for me. That's an amazing thing. Um, but there's some, I, I think it's hard to get my um, blood 
um, glucose test every day? Yeah. All right. So your diet sounds like it's really helping you and your granddaughter, but the blood sugar is, is kind of burdensome. What is mm -hmm. the... What is the glucose, what is it about the testing that makes it tough for you? I think sometimes it's hard to, to, to remember. Yeah. Are you having any difficulties with the cost of the strips or getting the strips or that's no problem? No, no, I'm getting from the Ryan Chelsea Clinic. So my, my, my main issue is to remember to do it every day. It's hard to, to keep on track. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Any medications right now that you find particularly helpful? Um, Are there medications? That's a good one. Um, I find medication for my dizziness particularly helpful, uh, but uh, for uh, but insulin injections every day they are quite burdensome, and I know they are helpful, but uh, injections I don't like them. And also I have to remember my antihypertensives. I don't know if they help or not um, because my blood pressure is under range. So I have to remember taking them. So your blood pressure is not always well controlled or your blood pressure is not always at the number you were hoping or? Um, it is and that's why it is under control and that's why I'm not sure if it's worth taking them or not. But no side effects, like you don't get dizzy or fall because of your blood pressure meds, or you're not sure. Uh, no, I uh, my uh, dizziness medication helps, so I fortunately haven't fallen or okay. get. Okay. All right. So it's this has been extremely helpful. I think. Um, you've given me a lot of great information that'll help me to start to think through what the best next steps will be. Um, if you could just share with me the one thing that's really getting in the way right now, um, just to reiterate, is it the dizziness or I think you mentioned the shortness of breath um, that's really the most bothersome for you? Or would you say it's more around the insulin therapy that stands out the most that interferes with your goal to be with your friend Carter? Carla, you can take this one. I think it's the dizziness. It really yeah. can't walk. Yeah, that uh, makes perfect sense. Um, so y'all might have noticed that you just got so much information um, from seating like 11, I don't know, 15 minutes. I don't know how long we took, not too long um, doing this. And if I could, um, I would put you in breakout rooms where you could talk with each other and talk about well, as a physician with the knowledge that I have about this patient, what are some good places I might start? Um, but I'm just gonna recreate this person now de novo, um, not having had a list of diseases, right? So we didn't start out with somebody with an age and diseases. And, and usually when we present a human being to one another, we give them as an age and a and a gender, we genderify them, and we give them a list of diseases. But instead, we're, we're, we're creating this person from what actually matters to them, which is their friend Carter and walking. And we can actually infer a lot about what their diseases are and where we could start by thinking about what actually matters to them in their life, what's burdensome to them right now. And, um, and without me even telling you what we guide people with when it comes to clinical decision making, um, just start to think in your mind where you might start. Um, so this is probably a patient with diabetes with some sort of complication um, that's resulting in, you know, being on insulin therapy. It sounds like it's probably not well controlled because they're probably intermittently using their insulin. Um, but on the bright side, now we know Carter's really important to them. So if we have to emphasize getting the diabetes under control in order to help them um, to navigate the world and continue to walk in the park, that'll be a good um, motivating factor. Probably has some osteoarthritis or some deconditioning that's leading to the shortness of breath or maybe a more systemic 
issues such as a lung problem or a heart problem. Um, this dizziness sounds like um, it sounds like it's not necessarily positionally related. It sounds like it's related to something that's happening when they're out and about and walking um, and they're having sort of these almost it sounds like spells we haven't really gotten into sort of putting our doctor hats on with these follow up questions. Um, but you already sort of have a sense of like, what are the, the various things that this might be. And now you know this person's probably not going to want like an invasive um, look, but they'd be okay with diagnostics, right? So um, if you wanted to do sort of, you know, you kind of have a sense of where you could cast a line and figure out what organ could be off here that we could really, really a, a, attach to this issue and where we could get started. Um, so as I'm sort of talking about these out loud, what is a, where is somewhere you might start in clinical decision making for this person? I think I'd look at the medications and the dosages that they're taking. I know they mentioned um, the blood pressure and then of course the insulin, both of which can contribute to the dizziness. Awesome. All right. So if we're gonna start in that area, how would you frame it to the patient? What could you say? So I'll be the patient now. You guys can tell me, where do you wanna get started? How would you frame this? Um, I guess I would say something along the lines like, so it sounds like a lot of your, well, your main concern is the dizziness and it sounds like you have trouble um, remembering when to take the uh, blood or, you have a, a concern about taking your blood pressure medication because your BP has been well controlled and also the insulin, the injections is something you're not enjoying. Could you tell me a little bit more about, you know, your medication regimen currently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could really, you could really simplify this, right? You could, you could say there's, there's many things we could do. Among them are a couple of different options. Where do you want to start? And I think that that sounds great um, for, for some people, um, having a couple of different options is, is a wonderful thing. How could you pull in to the way you frame that, what matters most to this person so that they can keep their eye on the prize, which is getting to that park with Carter? So say he said, well, let's go about the blood pressure meds. I'm really sick of them. I don't want to be on so many, many medications. And at the end of the day, I think that that's probably, you know, a major contributing factor. So how would you frame that and pull in what matters most? Um, I guess you can say like when you're going on walks with Carter, um, what stops you or what um, prevents you from getting to the finish line and being able to finish that 30 minute walk. And I know that you've mentioned maybe it's that shortness of breath also. Um, what do you think is causing your shortness of breath? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, that's a really good way of sort of getting more history so that you know where to get started. So yeah, when I'm walking, I get short of breath and it's like, I just need to sit down. And when I sit down, you know, my breath will come back, but, you know, I feel kind of embarrassed and like I'm getting old and Carter's not going to want to be my friend anymore. Um, and, but these spells, they just come on so strong. And if I sit down, you know, maybe two to five minutes later, I can just get back up and we can finish the walk. Do you ever find that um, when you have more shortness of breath, when you aren't taking your medications regularly? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I've tried skipping um, 
the diuretic uh, because it always makes me have to urinate and I don't even want to go on walks when I have to urinate. So I've, I've tried skipping it. And actually I feel more short of breath on those days. Um, even though I don't have to urinate as much, uh, I definitely, it gets worse. What time do you take the diuretic and then what time do you go on the walks normally? Yeah, I usually, I take the diuretic in the morning and try to push the walk till later. Um, but sometimes Carter has to go earlier, so I skip the morning. I would skip it in the morning. Maybe we can try to adjust the diuretic um, either the dose or the timing so that it doesn't affect your walk as much in terms of the urination. But I really think that being able to breathe on your walks is important to you based off of what you're saying. So I think that um, just changing around the timing would be best. Uh, okay. Yeah, that actually sounds like something I could do. I mean, I guess I was just going by what the cardiologist said was just to take that in the morning. Um, but, you know, if there's some way to, to sort of take it at a different time or to plan the walks a little differently, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, you know, I didn't end up wanting to see the cardiologist ever again because I didn't agree with some of the things that they were saying. I didn't want to be on all those other medications too. I heard bad things about statins and stuff. So I didn't always trust sort of what was going on there, but I really trust you because I feel like you have my best interest in mind because you understand me. Um, so you're hired. I'll, I'll keep seeing you. You're great. <laughs> uh, so you nailed it. Like you literally nailed it. So without me going into like how to do this, this, this becomes intuitive, right? This is the way you would want to be treated. You would want your loved ones to be treated. Um, so going back to not screen sharing that, is this back on my slide set? Can you guys? Slides. Oh, good, thank you. So the navigation I find going through my health priorities with my patients myself is I, I've already got everything I need in order to make really good clinical decisions for this person that they will actually do in their lives. And I can combine what I now know about them with my deep knowledge of internal medicine, the basic tenets of what I think are, is happening. And for this person, I think there's probably a Starling's kind of curve issue with his, um, with some probably heart failure, who knows if it's preserved or not, but we're sort of getting at who, who this person is um, in a backwards way, right? By asking questions and getting the history from them and finding out also what they're willing and able to do. Um, and it sounds like we can probably get them to take that diuretic on a regular basis if we, adjust the way that we're talking about it. And that's what a lot of patient-centered care is all about. And that's why so many programs, even disease-based programs of patient-centered care works is because it, it incorporates, it folds in that motivation, that connecting with that person, their lives and connecting what they're receiving in terms of their healthcare with that instead of, you know, what was your weight? It, it becomes, were you able to walk with your friend Carter, um, that becomes your follow-up question. So the, the real lift then becomes to give up to grow. So you have to give up this new language you've learned in medical school. We've, we've talked you out of talking like a person <laughs> in the community and to talking like doctors and presenting cases in the way we do. You kind of have to give up being being a force of this new um, language with people and, and start to let their language populate the way you speak with them. So you let their language around being with Carter, um, the symptoms that are troublesome, you, you use their words to help them to arrive at conclusions that align with what, they're, what they really wish to occur in their lives. And a little bit of this is practicing in the dark. So I will not say that it is clear to me all the time how to best approach a person, 
but it means that I haven't asked them enough questions or I haven't gotten to a goal that was specific or realistic enough that I could start to really make meaningful medical decisions on their behalf. So the fact of the matter is you've been practicing in the dark with these older adults because oftentimes they are not adhering to the complex medical problems, medical plans we've, we've given them to, to perform and do there is a lot of uncertainty around whether or not treating perfectly their blood pressure is going to be the best thing for their dizziness and um and falls and things that they might have been facing so you have all these trade-offs that you've been dealing with and um really complex decision making is occurring so what we're what we do here is we suspend all of that we say we know that's true but we also know that there's a person here with a goal that they could define for us, that we could align all of our work around. And what's really beautiful is that I find when I do that, I hit all those metrics of blood pressure, diabetes, because I already know I want to. And so all I have to do now is frame them around him staying connected with Carter and walking. So long as I can build the story um, they can then feel motivated and interested in trying things that they might not otherwise have wanted to do. So the way I we've been teaching and thinking about how to work with patient centered care in the setting of multiple chronic illnesses and in older adults, we give language tips and what's really nice is that you guys actually came up with some of these. Um, so I see you're concerned about your dizziness walking in the park is getting rough and difficult because of your shortness of breath these episodes let's talk about what might be going on and what we can do to help um, and you can acknowledge this uncertainty that's always been lurking in the background the uncertainty and the need for serial trials and let's flip it let's say you know these breathing spells could be you know, from a multitude of things. I don't know. Instead, you can say there's several possibilities. There's a few places we could start. Here's the two to three. And you guys came up with two really good places to start. And there's other things we can try later if needed. So you really flip the whole paradigm and say, hey, if we don't know what it is, it means there's many things we can try. Um, and we can work together to overcome these challenges. So chronicity, we talked about that. These, some of these diseases aren't gonna go away. The shortness of breath, the 20 minutes, not 40 minute walks. You know, we may never get to a place that somebody um, might've been earlier in their life or before a certain disease occurred. Um, so we may not be able to completely resolve your symptom or impairment, but we can do help you to get back to walking more easily using these interventions. And, you know, in the future, maybe we'll try some physical therapy, you know, to get you back more conditioned. Maybe we'll do a stress echo and check on that heart and make sure that we really have you optimized. You know, there's a lot of things we can do. And we can guide um, this patient to identify those achievable goals based on that value. So if walking became something he could no longer do, you know, if a time comes where we can't really get you back out there with Carter the way that we were, we can discuss how you can experience what is most important to you. Um, in some ways, it could be, you know, an aid and, you know, say he had a stroke and he still wants to connect with Carter and do these walks. It could become that, you know, an aid for a couple of hours, three times a week that takes him out um, in a wheelchair. And, you know, it, it just, the, the need to connect with his friend doesn't have to go away. It, it can stay really in your, your sight. Whereas that one thing that you're doing to get him there, that would change over time. And you're gonna collaborate with others. So if we're going to be, if he was willing to see his cardiologist, you may need to reach out to a cardiologist and say, we're gonna try a couple of different things because he's not really adhering. And what matters most to him right now is going on these walks with his friend Carter for 20 minutes in Central Park each day. And you'll be, amazed some of you will become specialists some of you will stay um, general um, but when you start a conversation by saying what matters most to um, our shared patient mr miles is 
you know, suddenly you're, you're at, you're on an even table, like whether or not a, a study said one thing or another thing, you, you are both talking it on behalf of this person and you feel a sense of collaboration as opposed to citing trials that may not apply to his particular case and may not be things he's willing or able to do. So this is what I do to document. A lot of people ask me, well, you do all of this great work, but how are you documenting it? And I wanna take you through it. Um, I won't, I will try to keep this as clear as possible. I, I didn't, I only had like one day to prepare for this. So forgive me, but I wanna show you because I always get this question, how do you document? I love this stuff um or this seems impossible how is it possible that you even do this um i really do do this with my patients i don't always do it perfectly um but it's what i aspire to and i make the one thing become my chief complaint so i think one of our reviewers for that upcoming article said maybe it's been hiding patient-centered care has been hiding in plain sight this whole time so rather than a chief complaint that's something like follow-up for blood pressure um, we could say the one thing I want to focus on, and in this case, it was, uh, this is a real, this is actually what I documented. Um, the one thing I want to focus on is getting more help and my incontinence um, so that I can keep walking and spending time outside for a couple of hours twice a week for this patient. And um, for her, what matters most, I always try to include like a really succinct matters most in preference, and I just pull those through. I don't usually have to change those unless something big happens. So this was pulled from her original appointment. She loves to walk, shop, sit on a bench in the yard and socialize. Spirituality joins church by Zoom. Fewer pills, prefers natural things, thinks the acetaminophen is great, doesn't like the furosemide because the urgency, and she doesn't ever want to undergo bladder Botox again. <laughs> so, um, you know, these little things that actually, if you document them, um, especially when it's like, I don't want to take a blood thinner and I have AFib, if you have that documented in your note, you're covered. You know, these are things that, you know, you might feel like you're, you're you know, people aren't adhering to their insulin therapy. They're not doing this, they're not doing that. We'll just document their preferences. And then, you know, people can see why, you know, what's going on? Why isn't this working? Well, oh, it's not aligned with what they're willing and able to do right at this point in their lives. Um, the usual suspects uh, here, I always try to include my specialists because I am going to collaborate with them. And as I go through each one of her medical issues that she's bringing up, I try to tie it back to what matters most to her is getting out, um, being in the world. And amazingly, I get through a lot of diseases. So disease-based medicine doesn't go out the window. It just becomes my way of communicating what I'm doing with other doctors, not necessarily the way that I'm interacting with the person sitting in front of me. And then in my assessment and plan, that's where I really try to weave my story. Um, this is a longer one. I did a lot in this visit, but I thought it was helpful for people to see in terms of teaching. Um, so I talk about being in service to the one thing instead of reviewing the medical problems we know she has or her age. Um, I don't find that to be fruitful or helpful. Um, it's listed elsewhere. Uh, and to the one thing in service to the one thing to focus on getting more help to uh, walking, spending out time outside for a couple hours twice a week, I ordered PT at home and I had the social worker review her aid hours to see if we could increase them. She has a preference for fewer medications. So we're gonna trial a lower dose of omeprazole and maybe we could discontinue that one. And considering the bothersome symptom of urinary incontinence that got in, interfered with her goal, I offered motivational counseling about that the symptoms were unlikely to be fully resolved, um, that she needs to keep taking the furosemide if she's gonna balance her breathing and heart function, which is shockingly close to the story we were just coming up with with our patient, Mr. Miles, so that she's able to leave her apartment and spend time outside. She endorsed understanding. She's willing to continue on the furosemide for, a few, uh, for at least uh, the next few days. I increased her furosemide because she had not taken it, and now she was starting to have signs of being um, overloaded, and that I'm going to coordinate this diuretic and recommendation with her cardiologist. You know, 
the cardiologist and I need to, to talk about this. So I'm, so I kind of pulled in this really pretty large plan into one visit and there are my diagnosis codes. They didn't go away. It's just that I tied the whole story together in terms of this person's life and what they, their actual goals are and what they were willing and able to do. Um, yes, playing catch with my grandson. You guys wrote some things into the chat and taking a bathroom break on the walk is an awesome idea, Sam. Um, so I tried to leave a little bit of time for your questions. Um, and so I'm, I'm here if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Diamond, for I'm definitely going to model this assessment and plan. I think it's fantastic. At the same time, you have all your ICDs, which are, again, important in one of our, um, as part of the, our documentation. Um, so, guys, I'm going to mute myself. If you want to ask any questions and mute yourselves, just ask in the chat. Dr. Davenport, this is awesome. I don't know if this is necessarily a question, but is there any reason why this can't be, you know, expanded to every patient we have? There's no reason in my mind that, like, have you studied this in a younger population? Yeah, I do it with all of my patients that I see. Um, of course, as a geriatrician, I don't see younger patients, but I can think of so many younger patients that would have benefited from being able to at least say what was the reason why um, they weren't adhering to diabetes care or to sickle cell anemia um, protocols. And, you know, how often do we not allow people the time to talk about their lives and what matters to them? Personally, I feel like this is the frame shift I needed in my own career to feel like I was actually the healer that I had planned on becoming when I entered into medical school. Um, so, I practice with everyone, including patients with severe dementia who can no longer speak for themselves. Um, I reframe things. I realize I have to, um, but some of the goals we come up with are just so beautiful. Like, um, I would like that my mother can come out of her bedroom for 30 minutes on weekend days so we can all pray together as a family. Okay, that's, that's really profound what are we gonna to do to get her out of that bedroom, right? So you start to collaborate on the level of the soul with the person. And I think that that is something that is missing in a lot of what we do in medicine today. So how long should a visit ideally be for us to be able to do this comprehensive assessment of our patients? And should, we, should it be something that we do at the beginning when we're meeting our patients or can it be implemented at any point in time? So the more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, I, when I first started, I just called people that new patients that I was going to get, I would call one per week, two per week, three per week. And then by the first month of just doing a couple per week, I said, all right, I think I can do this in a clinic visit and not, not blow it. Um, you can break this up into two different time periods, like you could get to goals and not do preferences. And next time you see them, get into preferences. Um, but I would say you want to practice first in a setting where you don't feel as constrained by time. That's why I took some of like my administrative time or a quieter day where I could make one phone call and practice facilitating by phone um, or take one part of the interview, seed like five, 10 minutes of your time, and then hit the salient points that you need to at that clinic visit. So for each person, it's gonna look a little different, um, but you'll know, you'll maybe have a patient that you already know that you're following longitudinally, that is a total bear, and you cannot figure out why. I, I would be surprised if not, if facilitating their priorities with them by phone or during your next visit, giving up that time so you can find out what's really happening in their lives, that you might learn and think of new ways of approaching them clinically. 